Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Beautiful day. <laughs> uh, this morning, Bill Waldridge, would you bless us with a prayer, please? <clears throat> Can someone help Bill, please? <laughs> if you get an opportunity today, look at Joe Avell's belt. He's got this fancy belt on today. Thank you. Good morning, Rotarians. Dear Heavenly Father, we have recently celebrated Memorial Day when we remember those who gave their lives that we may live in peace and freedom. Let us never forget those who served us and our country and never forget those at freedom that does not come for free. Let us remember how blessed we are. Amen. Thank you, Bill. And now to do the four-way test and the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Mr. Kelly Brennan, please. <laughs> Time will tell. If you'll face the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And now the four way test. Uh, number one, number two, number three, and number four. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And and number three, Andy, you gotta Andy Morse, you gotta pay attention. Andy, thank you for being here on time this morning, Andy. And pay pay attention to number three about building better friendships when you talk to Kelly Brown that way. Um <laughs> Patrick and I um I, I assume you're gonna be there on Saturday, Patrick. Um, we're going to have the um, annual boy, uh, boys, um, Boy Scout pool cleanup. Uh, so those people that are interested in joining us, we could use your help. Joe Avella, he loves doing the lockers, especially with little green frogs. Um, and uh, I think Marilyn, is she here? Marilyn's going to be there. Evan McCauley might bless us. So, you know, we'd like to have probably about six to eight. Uh, a great lunch served afterwards, right, Patrick? Great burgers and hot dogs. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce or uh, bring our um, president, Joe Avella. Uh, Joe, <laughs> Joe Boys. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Um, I'm always interested when we do the, the four-way test to hear how people um, list the numbers, whether they do ordinal numbers or cardinal numbers, right? First or one. I just, I'm always fascinated by that. You have to decide which one you're going to do. All right. Um, you know, Rich, when you're, when you're Sergeant Arms, you don't steal my, um, my announcements. All right. So uh, let's just stay in our lane, bro, wherever you are. The first thing I want to say is um, we, uh, we are having a cleanup at Camp Manitowoc on, um, on uh, Saturday, uh, Nick, this coming Saturday, the 10th. So if you're available from 815 to 1130, you want to do that. This is the way we do it. Second thing is board of directors meeting next Wednesday following uh, our, our morning meeting. It'll be my last one to preside over, and I'll hand the gavel to Terry and then duck when she tries to throw it back at me, all right? Um, what else we have? Oh, changing of the guard. The, the, um, the end of our year is a changing of the guard dinner. If This year, it'll be on the 28th. Um, I'll tell you next week where it's going to be, but if you'll just circle the 28th and you keep your evening, you know, from six to eight available, uh, we'll have a, a, a plan uh, to go to dinner somewhere here nearby and, um, and have a changing of the guard. There'll be no morning meeting on the 28th because we'll meet in the evening. Okay. That's all. Terry, you have some. And no morning meeting on the 5th. So two weeks in a row then. In celebration of Independence Day. Yes, that sounds great. <laughs> okay. And now I'm going to bring up our former our past president, Joe Avella, who's going to introduce our speaker. Oh. 
Okay, good morning, Rotarians. Uh, the month of June, we have uh, an interesting program on community safety. Uh, looking forward to uh, next Wednesday, we'll have uh, Dana Addis. We'll speak about uh, school safety. And then we'll have Chief Jerry Varnes back uh, the following week to talk about the uh, fire safety and home safety. Today, we were going to have uh, Chief Perry Tay back with us, but the chief came down with bronchitis, decided not to share it with you. So he uh, appointed his able assistant, uh, Lieutenant Kevin Gahagan. So uh, I will let Kevin introduce himself. And Kevin, if you can come on up. Here's the mic. Oh, thank you, thank you. Please hold your applause. <laughs> I saw Ed, I see Ed up there on the, uh, the screen. I've known Ed for quite some time since I first started here. Uh, like uh, this nice gentleman said, uh, my name is Lieutenant Kevin Gahagan. I've been with the city of Hudson Police Department for the last 24 years. Last May, May 25th was my 24th anniversary. Uh, so the countdown is on, the calendar at home is on for 25, which is uh, when I could retire. Will I retire? Probably not. Uh, the city of Hudson has been really great for me and my family and, and all the friendships that we've made. Uh, during Actually, before I started in Hudson, I was an undercover narcotics agent in, uh, in Lake County. That's where I first started. And I looked, I looked a little younger than I do right now. I looked really, really young when I came out of the academy. Um, so at, at one point in time, they were going to send me back into high school. Uh, but right before that was going to happen, I got offered a job here at Hudson, and I couldn't pass it up because I grew up locally in Streetsboro uh, as a kid. Uh, starting in Hudson, I was on the road patrol uh, for the first five years. They try to get your feet wet, you know, get the, the knowing of the community, the streets, and, and the, the businesses, and the, and the people that live here. Um, after that, I joined the Metro SWAT team. Um, uh, and I was on the Metro SWAT team uh, and just up until 20, 2020. I was on there for 15 years, uh, and I retired from that team as an assistant commander. Uh, so you start at the bottom, and you're out on the perimeter where you really don't get paid too much attention to, but you really have to pay a lot of attention uh, to, the, to the building. And then I moved into the entry team, and then I was a team leader, and then I, and I moved up to uh, the assistant commander where you sit in the van and you make all the plans for the other people that are down on the ground, kind of like what I am now. I am the patrol lieutenant for the city of Hudson Police Department, and I'm in charge of the, the sergeants that are on the road, which are in charge of the road patrol officers that you see driving out in town. So every time you see somebody in a, in a marked patrol car, um, I am in somewhat in charge of what they do every day and, and, and responsible for them. Uh, so the chief uh, asked me this morning, he does really apologize. Uh, he hasn't been looking too good the last couple of days at the office. Uh, you can see him getting worse and you'd say something to him and he'd be like, I can't hear you because his, his, his left side is all blocked up and he can't. So he really does apologize that he can't be here. But he asked me to come to talk to you today about critical incidents uh, and the things that the city and the Hudson Police Department uh, are doing to prepare for those critical incidents. And one of the one of the major critical incidents that we're practicing for or preparing for is uh, active shooters. And what is an active shooter or an active threat or an active killer? And we've seen a lot of the news reports uh, and this stuff is happening far too frequently in society. Uh, it's a situation where one or more people are in the process of causing death or injury or posing an immediate danger thereof. And we've seen examples of Uvalde or even uh, at uh, child care centers or large businesses. Um, and they're not hostage situations. They're not a standoff where, where the SWAT team would get called out. And the standoff is where somebody takes somebody hostage or somebody doesn't want to come out of their home. Um, and the local police department can't handle that. And that's where they would call the SWAT team. That's not what the, we're talking about. And we're not talking about a barricaded subject. We're talking about somebody who is actively going through a business or a school causing death or injury to somebody. Now, it's, that's not to say that it can't turn into that situation. And sometimes that does happen. Uh, for example, Uvalde, 
where that subject took those those uh, poor kids hostage in that room until the threat was neutralized. Uh, and like I said, it can turn into that. Uh, and the reality of the situation is it's a sad reality, but it is reality. There's no sanctuary anymore. We've seen this happen in schools and malls, playgrounds, parks, and churches, and there's really no safe place anymore. And we must be prepared for this type of crisis. Uh, and I feel at Hudson being involved in the training that we do there with the chief and the other lieutenant, I feel that we are prepared uh, at the city of Hudson Police Department to respond to incidents uh, that may come up. Uh, what procedures do we use at HPD? Uh, it's difficult to establish uh, and or apply any specific procedure to an, uh, to an active shooter or threat type of event. These situations are unpredictable, fluid, and evolve quickly, and they really, really do. Uh, because of this, we plan for and train in the use of different tactics and techniques that can be used in order to minimize the loss of life in these events. Um, Going back to SWAT, I've been on numerous critical incident situations, and every time we always put a plan together, and we try to follow that plan step by step. But 99% of the time, usually something happens while the situation is evolving where that plan just goes, goes awry. And you have to, to really rely on all the training that you've done before to prepare yourself you know, to handle that situation. Uh, what are we doing to ensure preparedness? Uh, we've placed SROs in the schools. So we've assigned them for prevention and deterrence and response. Uh, and recently, within the last month or two, we've worked with the schools and we've signed a contract to add an additional SRO. So now we will have three SROs in the schools. Um, and at one point in time, I know there was a discussion about uh, putting a canine it, with one of those officers, I'm not sure where that planning part is in, is is involved yet, but I know we've had many discussions about that. Uh, some non-traditional responses that that we've practiced: uh, single officer response um, is is where the officer, whoever's closer to the threat, would get there and neutralize that threat immediately, the best they can. CIFA is a critical injury and in first aid, so each officer is trained in critical injury and first aid. And the, uh, the RTF is the rescue task force, which is made up of uh, fire and EMS workers in a partnership with the PD. Uh, now going back to the single officer rescue, um, we've provided the officers with equipment that they're gonna need in incidents like this. We have breaching kits. Um, and what are, what are breaching kits? Breaching kits is a, is a pack with a set of tools in there. There's a Halligan tool, there's a sledgehammer, there's a door ram that uh, we have access to. We've reached, recently purchased three kits for the department and are training our officers to get into uh, secured facilities where somebody may barricade doors or lock them securely. So we've, we've purchased tools to help those officers gain entry into those buildings. Um, and subsequently going back to, to SWAT, I was an explosive breacher it was part of my training. It was really cool. I got sent down to uh, to Georgia to learn how to blow stuff up. And who's not going to really want to do that? They, I mean, they they're like, go. We're going to send you to Georgia. We're going to train you with some dynamite and some dead cord and some C4. We're going to train you to blow through holes through walls and and get through doors uh, safely. Um, and sometimes we've actually used that uh, once in Cuyahoga Falls, which was really good. But it was during a critical incident where we needed to get inside the building very quickly and safely. And the best way to do that was to blow a hole right through the door. Um, uh, training and in-service. We do, we do 40 hours of in-service training every year for every officer that we have. But we also provide that uh, for some Peninsula officers too, since we dispatch for Peninsula. Um, the next year, we would like to come back and talk to you a little bit more about about our in-service classes and the, and the types of the trainings that we do. But we do um, really concentrate. Uh, last year, we concentrated on uh, school response. And during that, we we kind of set up scenarios of, of like historical events that have happened, Uvalde or or Columbine and, and on how to how would we like you to respond uh, either in single officer for 
format or um, sometimes if two or more get there, then they would go in together. Uh, other partnerships that we have, with, uh, like I said, with the schools, but we do partner with other law enforcement agencies, uh, local, state, and federal. Uh, we have, um, it's an agreement, it's a mutual aid agreement with the local agencies that surround Hudson. So if something were to happen in Hudson where we needed additional bodies at the ready, we would just call every agency or send out a radio to transmit that we need your help. And every agency around us would just send send bodies to help. Uh, we would do the same if that if you know if the request came from any agency, and and we have done that before. Uh, and the community, and uh, that's another partnership that we have. And we've worked, we believe we worked with the community very well. Um, programs like this and getting the information out there uh, when we need when we need help or if we need to uh, to uh, get that information out there. You guys are a great resource to do that. Uh, traditional responses and tactics to active shooters. 30 years ago, when Columbine happened, it was basically, you know, the agency would respond to the incident, but they weren't really prepared. So they would call the SWAT team. Um, but that would take, that that just took too long. And we learned that back then, uh, where you would call, you would stay, the agency would set up a perimeter, they would call the SWAT team, and then the SWAT team would come and handle the situation. Sometimes that's okay hey, now, but that's when when things aren't fluid anymore. Um, so then they transitioned back in 1999 to the quad or diamond four officer formation where you would wait for four officers to respond and then you would form a diamond and then you would move through the building in a diamond formation to neutralize the threat as fast as you can. But again, that that didn't seem to be quick enough. Um, so now what we train on is an, it's really a non-traditional response. It's a single officer response. Um, it's again, like I said, when you get to the location, you find out where the threat is and you may have to ask people that are injured on the ground and are wanting your help, but your job is to get in there and neutralize the threat as fast as you can. Uh, going back to critical engineer injury and first aid, um, this, the CFA training that we have, all HPD officers uh, undergo a basic first aid CPR and AED training as well as CIFA. And Chief Tabak is our, our, is our lead instructor uh, in CIFA. And it enables officers to use medical skills necessary to save his or her life or the life of another in a high threat environment before arrival of EMS services. Because usually when, that, when, when a critical incident goes down, it's, the police usually get there faster than the EMS. And we have to secure the scene before EMS can get in there. And we have to be able to take care of ourselves. Uh, with tourniquets, uh, each officer carries a tourniquet on their person every shift. Those have been donated by the Kiwanas, and they're very helpful. We train uh, in those every year. Uh, we're able to control hemorrhaging, uh, hemorrhaging control and sealing chest wounds. So those are the things that we practice every year to make sure our officers are, are, are knowing what to do in, in critical situations. Uh, the rescue task force, like I talked about, up before, it's a concept uh, designed to get life-saving medical treatment to victims in active shooter events. Uh, much sooner than traditional deployment methods, it involves placing EMS providers in forward positions protected by law enforcement to provide emergency medical intervention immediately while efforts to secure the scene continue. Um, and I know, I believe through a grant, uh, EMS and fire have purchased uh, tactical vests and helmets, and they practice uh, donning that stuff uh, to respond to events. Uh, and I know we've worked in partnership with them to get them ready to respond. If in the unlikely, of, I'm not going to say unlikely because it could happen uh, in the in the event that it that stuff does happen here. Just to let you know that we are we are have that team ready and we are prepared to respond if necessary. Uh, just to continue on the. The topic of our partnerships with the schools, we do our best to, to keep open lines of communication with the SROs actively involved uh, in early prevention and threat assessment uh, through cooperative training between HPD and schools. Uh, we do include that CIFA and active shooter training for school staff. Uh, the other agencies, like I said, local and state communication, mutual aid, sharing and resources of equipment, uh, follow-up 
of investigations and cooperation between HPD, HFD, EMS uh, to implement the uh, the response task force. On in the community, we are our partnerships and training for community houses of worship, businesses, other community groups. Uh, like I said, the Kiwanas, the Western Reserve Hospital uh, uh, donated the IFEC kits, and those are our first aid kits uh, that. Every car that we have out on the, in, in the city has first aid equipment, like, like tourniquet, additional tourniquets, uh, gauze, uh, hemorrhaging packets, stuff to stop bleeding. Um, and all that stuff has been donated uh, by Western Reserve Hospital and the Kiwanis, and we really do appreciate that. Um, so I, I just want to keep you guys aware that, that we do practice this stuff uh, continually. Um, uh, in roll calls, and uh, and that, like I said, every every year we have a forty hour service in service training that we we go over specific topics, and this is one of the major topics that we do train on every year, just to let you, just to keep you, just to keep us up to date, uh, and to keep all of our officers trained up uh, the best we can. So that's really all I have for today. I'm open for any questions that you guys have. I'm not going to stand behind this. I, I really feel restricted. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to come down here and be a little bit more relaxed. And I'll, I'll try to answer your questions the best I can. Well, thank you, first of all, for coming. We really appreciate it. You're really welcome. Such a late yeah. I, when I was um, in high school in the 1980s, the, um, the school resource officers were mostly trying to, uh, you know, chase down people who had some marijuana or cigarettes or, you know, uh, other sorts of um, uh, contraband in the school. Um, today's resource officers are in a serious, you know, threat. Uh, they're, I think they're, you know, the, the, the threats they face are, are much more severe. Is there a different way in, in, in your career? Have you seen a different type of person that has been recruited for, you know, being resource officers? And are they... Um, are they, I don't know, is there some, a different type of attraction or, you know, repulsion from that? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. There's really no specific mold when it comes to, to selecting a resource officer. We, we try to find the ones that, um, that are easy to talk to and are able to communicate effectively because they play so many different roles when they're in, this, in the schools. They, they play a, a kind of like a, a counselor role. Uh, if a kid is feeling troubled and they're they're open enough to talking to them, but they also have to play that police officer role. When a situation arises, they have to take certain action. Um, and they kind of take on a, 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 maybe a consigliere role where the school is bouncing ideas off of them and they're giving their advice on how to handle a certain situation. So they wear many different hats. So it's kind of, it, it is, it's, it's a long process that we take at HPD to select those officers to make sure that we have the right fit. Thank you. Um, my name is Madeline P.D. Carino, and I wanted to ask you what proactive things does the police department do to uh, uh, prevent some of these incidents such as uh, maybe monitoring social media for any threats that are out there, because a lot of times with a lot of sh school shootings, there's been warning signs and threats prior to that. So what is the department doing? That so there's a hotline that's been set up with in conjunction with the city and the schools that where we get specific tips where where say a kid might be in school and he may hear somebody say something. And it's an anonymous line where they can leave specific information for us that we can follow up on and determine if the threat that is being said uh, is credible. And that it has happened a few times within this past year where we found out people have turned in tips and we found the threats to be non-credible. Those made that information aware by giving press releases and, and our detectives, our detectives are really great uh, because when some of those tips come in, they're usually being posted on social media. Um, so they've been really quick in finding out that information um, in partnership with either Facebook or Instagram, uh, and they've been able to get back that information 
question to us um, very quick with, with subpoenas, and we're able to work with those companies to determine whether or not those threats are there. And then once we get those threats, we place the officers in the specific area where we believe it might happen, just to give a deterrent um, and, and a little bit more of a, a good feeling residents and the students to say, hey, I know, I know the police officers are in my building right now, so I'm not I'm not really not that worried about the so-called threat that's been made. Yes, sir. Yes, please. My name is Phil Toby. Uh, first, I want to compliment you, to you and your team, how courteous they are and how friendly they are. Uh, every opportunity I've had a chance to meet with them, they've just been marvelous. <laughs> Secondly, this is a little bit more serious. The subject of deadly force. How would you define deadly force and how an officer applies those rules? when they're faced with an emergency situation? Tough one. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, you, the definition of it. How, what is, how, what is, the how, the what definition is of deadly force is, is an officer or even a, a regular citizen is allowed to use deadly force in the defense of their life or somebody else's life. Is it a tough decision to, to do? Yes. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have had to do it about six, about six years ago on the SWAT team. So it's, it was a situation where, you know, that was with the SWAT team and, and the, a girl was being held hostage. I, I didn't think we we're going to go down this road today, but we will. Um, and her life was being threatened and her, the, the, the female's life was being threatened by another male. Who had a weapon and that and and at the point where the situation resolved itself uh deadly force uh had to be used it was found to be okay um but it was a it was a tough decision a really really tough decision um so we prepare every officer to make that decision when that time comes and we train them in those scenarios and we practice that uh, during our in-service training, we'll, we'll, we'll create scenarios where you either have to use deadly force or you don't. Um, and going uh, back to your earlier question about the, the officers being polite, one of our main goals at HPD is positive contacts. That's really what we really preach to all the officers and the new officers that come uh, from different agencies, because we've really, we've had uh, six or seven new officers hired within the last probably five years. And they haven't been new hires um, that really have no experience whatsoever because that the history of it, you know, 25 years ago was you'd go take a, a test to be a police officer and there were two, 300 people um, to sign up to take that job. Nowadays, it's everybody's fighting for officers. Like if you're an up and coming college graduate who is majoring in criminal justice, you could you could walk into a police department and they would hire you on the spot um, because we're looking for people like that. Here in Hudson, we really don't we haven't had that problem. People really like the community. We offer a good package. Uh, it's historically been a safe community. Now we do have our our incidents here and there, um, but it's a really great place to work. So people want to come work for us. Um, so we're getting lateral transfers from Kent Police Department, from Canton Police Department. So sometimes w when they show up, we we really preach positive contacts. Um, and it looks like it's transcended to the community because that's really all the feedback that we're getting from you guys is, is when I ever meet a police officer, he's very, very courteous. Now, there are times where they might be a little mean, but depending on the situation, uh, they they still try to main, maintain some level of decorum and, and be respectful. And that's really what we preach to them. But uh, but that was to answer your first question. But going back, we, we do train everybody on the use of deadly force and they have to know the specific laws because there are specific laws that deal with that, that uh, topic. So hopefully that answered your question. I have uh, three things. First of all, is to thank you for your service to our community. Uh, I don't think people in your position receive thanks enough for what you do for all of us. Number two, number two I'm kind of curious, you know, little town like Hudson, Ohio, maybe a traffic stop, uh, 
I don't know. Uh, it just seems like a pretty quiet community from policing. I could be totally naive about what really happens in this town. I don't really know. All right. I, you, I read the Hudson Hub maybe for entertainment sometime. Like, oh my God, what happened in Hudson? Uh, number three, uh, I'm curious about the recruitment of police uh, into the profession. And I'll tell you why. I was at a large community event in Akron last month. Um, not really vilifying the police, but questioning the police about a very public shooting, all right? And words were being used in this forum that um, I just despised, all right? I mean, I came up, you respect police, you're a bit fearful of police, you don't run from police, you don't shoot at police, and you don't get shot and killed by police. Simple. Pretty good rules, all right? But yet, there's people on the stage vilifying your profession for the way that that gentleman politely used that word, got shot and killed, all right? right? And I mean, I just know of police in Akron who have retired from the profession because of the lack of respect for it. And I look at what you guys are doing to serve and protect, and you should be honored and thanked, let alone the stuff that is going on out there vilifying your profession and people leaving it. So I'm just kind of cranked up about this a little bit. And I'm wondering, how, um, how do you respond to that? But number two, how is that affecting your profession from a recruiting perspective? Well, like I said before, um, in the recruitment aspect, the city of Hudson is, has been very fortunate that, that people want to come and, and work in our city. Um, again, we we really hampered down on the officers that they're to treat everybody that they come in contact with, with the utmost respect. Um, because we feel that if, if we're giving respect to somebody, we're going to get that equally back. Now that doesn't always happen. It really doesn't, but that they are tasked with the responsibility of maintaining um, control of themselves at, at all times. And, and they understand that, when they leave the building, back to them. We give them lessons when they start the job with Hudson, and we, sometimes we have to remind them because we're human. We are. We have the same problems at home as everybody else. We deal with the same issues like everybody else. But then when we come to work, we're tasked with dealing with with everybody else's issues that we come in contact with. Like when you when you guys call us it's pretty much your worst day or you're looking for advice because you're having a problem at home with one of your kids or you're having a problem with your spouse or somebody's taking money from you that you didn't authorize. So we're there to help you guys. But again, we're, we're still dealing with stuff at home. So it's a, it's a good balancing act. And we've tried to find the process to get hired in Hudson is very extensive. It's, it's no easy task. We tried to, to pick the best of the best. And I would say 99% of our officers are college educated with either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And that's not saying you don't have to, you don't have to have a degree, but we found very great qualified candidates. They all, you know, the majority of them have degrees, which has helped us um, immensely in, in, in the, the maturation. Uh, they're more mature than, than somebody. And, and I know recently one of the, the state senators, because recruitment is so bad right now in Ohio, they want to hire 18 year olds. I, I can understand their reasoning for that because the, the numbers are so far down. Um, but that, I mean, that's a discussion for another time. But it, it Hudson, it, recruitment has been very easy for us um, because people, again, want to come here. The, the background checks are so extensive. We're able to, to really weed out the people that I, I don't know fit the philosophy that we're looking for, but um, we, we're able to select those um, that have the same thought process as us and and are want to be respectful, want to give positive context to people. So we've been really lucky in that aspect, and luckily we haven't had again. It's Hudson. It's a city. It has crime, but just we have the same crime as everybody else, just less, which we're very fortunate. 
Hi, my name is Mimi Becker. And one of the things that I'm wondering is how um, Hudson Police Department, it's, it's kind of strategic because it, it will involve coordination with fire department, et cetera, but we are probably in for a period of time when we are going to have significant numbers of electrical outages that take care of most of the town or sectors or severe storm events that require some kind of movement of population from one place to the other. Have you started doing some kind of strategic planning about how that would play out with respect to traffic control or you know, protecting people from whatever the, the storm event consequences were? So the answer is yes. Plans are already in place. Um, you know, I didn't really realize that stuff when I first started, you know, as a patrol officer. I was just, you know, go out there, write some tickets, talk to some people, take reports. But the higher you go in any profession that you have, you understand that there's more responsibility and there's more planning involved. Um, for things that might not happen. So yes, we do have uh, we do have mass incident plans between the fire department, service department, police department on what to do if there's a trail derail train derailment or a mass power outage. And I know there's that's been a big topic in the last few weeks because power has gone out uh, in town quite a, quite a bit. Um, and some of that is due to to the breaker system that uh, the substations. One was a squirrel, I think that. That happened last week. No, that it's it's actually ha it it did happen. <laughs> I I used to live in another location and we had a lot of power outages and every time we'd call, it was the squirrels. It wasn't because we hadn't been maintaining the power supply, but I I am I am aware that there are are groups of um, people in town who have no clue how they should respond. And if they're zipping down a road where there's no traffic lights functioning, do we, do we have um, a trigger that man's, you know, like 91 or something? Well, there's no, there's no generator that runs. It is supposed to be a four-way stop. Yeah. Four stop. And we will, we, if there happened to be an accident at that intersection, the police would respond, would deal with that accordingly. But we, we, we can put the information out there and we've put laws out there, but we can't be everywhere at once, unfortunately, to try to make sure that people are are acting accordingly. Hi, my name is Gail. So in response, number one, 18 year old should never be inducted into law enforcement. <laughs> Coming from a military or military, what we create and release back out in public sometimes is a nightmare. When you all have, are in a position where you have to use deadly force, what is the process for handling that officer emotionally? Because there is a form of PTSD that goes there when you have to take a life. And what is the process to currently take them off the road, make sure that they are okay, and vet it again before they're allowed to go back? because they can in fact become their own worst nightmare if it's not taken care of. Oh, I'm gonna give you my own personal experience, okay? And I don't really talk about this too much, but uh, <laughs> this is on Zoom, right? Is there any way to pause this? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia Getz. I'm a psychiatrist, and um, I thank you for talking about the trauma that police officers can have, um, because as the previous person said, a lot of times that's kept very secret and there's stigma. Um, what I want to bring up to you is, is it's you know, become very aware, especially in the national scene, that a lot of police officers are not trained in mental health. Um, and how to respond to somebody having a mental health crisis, whether they're psychotic, um, whether it's a domestic violence situation, 
um, whether it's a person with autism who would be confused about what the officer is asking. So what kind of in-depth training do Hudson police officers get in this area? So we have a program at, at the police station called the Take Me Home program, where we're, we get uh, the people that come in that have uh, that train with autism and, and people on the spectrum and mental illness uh, come in and, and give us information. Uh, on how to deal with persons with mental illness or autism. Uh, we have CIT officers uh, that are trained. On each officer that, that we have at HPD is, is required to go through CIT training. The problem is the classes fill up so much because of the need for that training. We can only get one or two in a year. So we're about, I think we're about 85% at HPD with CIT trained officers. Um, we have uh, blue bags that we carry inside uh, the cruisers um, that help us deal with mental health uh, calls. And, and these are some of the calls that we go on a lot in the city. Uh, with, uh, just because in, in society, it seems like it's just moving that, that direction. So we're preparing more and more. We, we do have a lot of discussions at the station on the re what resources we can rely on. And we have uh, information back at the station where the officers can make, make phone calls to um, there's agencies in Akron um, that, that we can take people to. Um, unfortunately, there are times where we do have to pink slip and, and pink slipping somebody is, is, is they're not in the right state of mind to take care of themselves. So we have to take over for them and, and, and send them to the hospital. Uh, and then we do follow-ups after that, but sometimes it always doesn't work. Um, so we are continually educating the officers at the station in training on how to deal with those. And so those are some of the scenarios that we do in in-service too and practice just to give those younger officers an idea on how to handle that situation. Yes, I, I on the theme of mental health, have you, uh, has Hudson, uh, the police department ever considered developing like a CI team, a T team, the crisis intervention team like they have in the bigger cities? Or do you have, uh, are you able to utilize their team members in a crisis? Um, well, going back to the, C the CIT trained officers that we have, we try to position them. So we have four shifts in Hudson, two night shifts and two day shifts. So we have we strategically plan a CIT, one or two officers on each shift. So one of them is available in case we get a, a specific type of call. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for <laughs> coming up. I think we may have identified a future speaker for us, <laughs> some of your experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, thank you for kind of opening up on that. I think, uh, as we discussed, my oldest is a is a cop in, in, in an area that <laughs> she's involved in lots of incidents. Um, although lucky for her, she has not had to fire her gun in her ten years at uh, CM, CMHA. But uh, I think it's it's good to have police officers who are affected by that. Meaning, I don't want you to be affected, but I mean, who think deeply about it. Uh, She's, and I'm sure you have encountered some officers who probably need to be more <laughs> mindful of, of these things. And, and you worry about the officers who would not be affected by, you know, being in that situation. So thank you for, for your service again. Um, so in another direction, so my, I grew up in a town called Ohio Park, which well, it was about a year ago, July 4th, they had a shooting at the 4th of July parade. Um, and actually, it was a resident whose family had lived in town for years, went up on top of, very similar to Hudson, it's about 10,000 more citizens, but uh, went up on top of one of the few buildings over two stories and uh, dressed as a woman and uh, used a long gun to shoot people. And then, and police were there everywhere, so it wasn't an issue of not having people, you know, protection there. But I guess my question is, you could look at that and say, okay, now we've got to protect, look at tall buildings and make sure no one's on it and make sure, you know, look at everyone and see if they can hide a long gun. But it seems like the, the lesson is how do you 
how do you kind of prepare for the unknown? So the next person who would think of trying to do something like that wouldn't do it in the same way, but would do it in some way that you wouldn't normally look twice at. So I don't know if there's a, a way you prepare for that or as you're at various parades and things that you're just, I don't know if it's widen the scope of what you're looking for or what you're being prepared for. Well, the the only thing I do know is is I don't know what I don't know. And that's, it, it has to do with communication with your family and communication with residents and, and keeping those open lines of communication with them. If, if you think something's not right, say something it's like, like that, uh, the saying says, see something, say something. We don't have a problem going out and talking to people. Um, we can, we can only prepare for what, we think might happen we, again we're not fortune tellers we can't see the future um so we can we can prepare with what the trends are uh going on right now and and, and try to predict what's going to happen but again we, we can't so we're doing our best to prepare our officers for every scenario and this is this goes along the lines of the same for every police department this is the thought process that we've had and it, it's changed from 30 years ago it used to be you know, react after the fact, but now we're, we're trying to prepare before those incidents happen. So people are in the mindset that they go into the situation better off equipped, better off equipped in their mind and better off equipped with what they're, they're carrying, their training, um, the equipment that we provide them. We try to provide our officers with the best equipment that we have around or access to. We're pretty fortunate here in town to do that. Some of the, some other agencies aren't able to do that. Uh, our use of body cams that we have has been just super for us. You know, just to review incidents with officers is you know sometimes we sit down with them and 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 just have a discussion of you know I, I see what you did here and you know this was the result happened is what we wanted. A way we could have done it. Um, it just opens their mind to solving problems. There's not always one way to solve a problem. In the old days, it was, you're going to jail. Let's go. They get incarcerated, they come out. Now there's there's so many different ways to solve problems uh, that you respond to with medical or, or mental health issues or or dealing with kids. It's not always handcuffed, take to jail. And, and uh, there's so many different ways. And with the technology that we've gotten, um, with body cams and in-car cams, and we're able to review that information with them to better prepare them uh, to go out on the street, and as well as the administration to make contingency plans uh, for major incidents or smaller incidents. Just, I mean, in a nutshell, we, we try to prepare for everything that we can, but um, it's kind of an impossible task, but we, we do our best. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's finished off, not so much of a question, but was asked about what the SROs do. Another piece is working as part of a team with the administration and the teachers. And it's called threat assessment, which may not be exactly the right term, but basically identifying kids who may be at risk at harming themselves or others. And yeah, we do. That is one of our, our programs that we do have is threat assessment. And, and that's happened from time to time where, you know, other students get concerned about students or teachers get concerned about students. And they go in and they sit down and talk with them. They have a threat assessment, determine whether or not it's it's a correct assessment or or it's just somebody having a concern. And it's been very helpful for us, very proactive and very successful for us so far. Thank you so much. And just one task, if you would pull out a winning number, um, our Rota Buck raffle is um, payout is $8 today. Jackpot two hundred and fifty four dollars. So, um, it, give us a number there. Sue, what's your number? Sue, what's your number? Joe, what's your number? That's what you're supposed to be saying. Nine two three five four three. All right, winner, winner. Well, I'll see he's on his way up here. Um, I have a question, which is, what happened to the black and whites, man? I like the black and whites, and and now we have these. 
obfuscated cars. <laughs> I know that's what it is. <laughs> is it? Oh, it's yeah. Well, again, thank you to our lieutenant for coming. And um, hey, everybody, have a great. Oh, there's a, there's a scanner up here. Is that for me? Oh, have a great day. Be great today. See you.